<laughs> so should I give yeah. it? Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I'm Genji, and I'm, I'm a junior. So Francesco and I recently started a club for people interested in theoretical neuroscience, and this is our first public event. So we are planning to like invite speakers on campus and organize workshop or potentially like work on research project together. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, like please join us. And Mr. Christopher Lee kindly accepted our invitation to come here and give a talk today. And so Chris graduated from Swarthmore with high honors in physics. Did you say with high honors? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Graduating from Swarthmore, he attended the University of Pennsylvania, and he is now a PhD candidate in physics. And he has been working on like very fascinating research that utilizes like techniques from statistical mechanics, information theory, and network science. So, and today he is going to talk about like, human learning and information processing with complex networks. So please join me. Big thanks to Genji and all of y'all for having me here. It's a lot of fun to come back and talk. Um, so as Genji said, I graduated in 2014. Um, I was a double physics and math major. Um, and I'm now doing my physics PhD at Penn, and I'm going to graduate this year. So I graduated in 14. So this is the end of my sixth year in my PhD program. Um, and if any of y'all have questions afterwards, I'm happy to to answer like what it is like to do a PhD, or and specifically what it's like to transition from sort more to doing a PhD. Um, and even though, so, my PhD is in physics, but I work predominantly in a in a neuroscience and cognitive science group at Penn. Um, and so I like to so in my research, I like to apply ideas from that I learned here at Swarthmore in physics and mathematics to understand human behavior and sort of human cognition. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you a, with, about a little bit of the work that I've been doing, um, having to do with how humans interact with, with networks in the world around us. So we're going to come at it from sort of two different perspectives. So one, how do humans learn the structures of networks in the world? And then the second direction will be, so what kinds of networks are able to communicate efficiently with humans? Um, so just to give you a super quick motivation, I'm going to try to also keep this at a pretty high level so that because I know it's an interdisciplinary group, um, and so I'll I'm going to get into a little bit of math, but I'll try to keep it strictly self-contained so that you can like try to understand everything that's going on. Um, but if you have any questions, just blurt out because I, I might just forget that I haven't defined something or something like that. Um, so we see networks around us in our life as like almost all the time. Uh, so a clear example would be language. So for instance, speaking the English language, you can think of it as a as a network where the words would be nodes in this network. And then the edges in the network would represent relationships between these words or or um, maybe sort of transitions from one word to another word. And you can also think of different musical pieces as networks. So the nodes would be notes and the edges would be transitions between these notes in some musical piece. And then one of my favorite examples is abstract concepts. So I'm attempting currently to convey a like complex web of ideas that have these complex interrelationships that you can think of as a network. Um, and interestingly, so we, even though we come across these networks almost ubiquitously in our lives, um, you almost never get to see the network from this top-down perspective. It's not like you've learned the English language by seeing a picture like this, or you, didn't, you don't listen to music by looking at the network of transitions between the notes. You, you only get to, typically, the way we interact with networks is we observe a sequence of stimuli or items. Um, and you can kind of think of this, these, the, this sequence as a random walk in the network. And what I mean by random walk is you just start at some node, and then you just go randomly to one of the nodes that's connected. So this guy has four connections. You could go there, 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 or over to here. And then you just keep doing that, and you'll generate a sequence of, of items in this network. Um, so 
And typically, as I said, when we, when we interact with networks, or when we receive information from networks, it's typically through these sequences, and the, the simplest being a random walk. Um, so just to give you an example, this is the network of, of words in Shakespeare's combined works. Um, so the nodes here represent words, and the edges represent transitions between the words in his work. And somewhere in this network, um, if you were to do a random walk, you would get the phrase to be or not to be somewhere in here. I don't know where. Somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in there. I, I should figure out where it is, actually. Um, so you can think of this, net, this problem, there being this huge network, but we only get to see these sequences. Um, so how do we learn the structure of the language that's underlying these sequences? So that's one question. Mm -hmm. What is the size of the dots? What are they representing? So the size, that's a good question. So the size of the dots here represent the number of connections that the node has, or what you call the degree of the node. So if you, it's hard to see here, but if we go back to here, so each node in this network has four connections. You would say it has degree four. Um, and in this network, I've just made, this is purely sort of a stylistic choice. I've made the nodes larger if they have more connections or if they have a higher degree. So you can see like this guy only has one connection, so it's really small. Um, and that will actually be useful in a little bit. So thanks for having me define it. That's one of the little things I always forget to define. Okay, so we have this, this picture in our head of a network trying to communicate information to a human, and the human only gets to see these sequence of items. And this raises two uh, questions. So first, if we focus on the human, you could ask, how do people do this inference problem? How do they only observe a sequence of items and then learn the structure of the network underlying that sequence, even though they never get to see the network itself. Um, and then you could sort of flip the script and focus on the network, and you could say what kind, you could ask questions about what kinds of networks are able to communicate more or less information to some human observer. Um, and we'll see that these two questions are actually pretty closely related. So we'll start with this first question. So how do humans learn the structure of networks from sequences of items? So anytime I try to start a research project, it's helpful to start with the, what's known in the literature. So what are sort of the, the typical results or typical expectations that people have? Um, and so one relatively well-established result at this point in cognitive science is that people are pretty good at detecting uh, transition probabilities between items. So if you see some sequence of stimuli, um, and suppose we see some sequence I a lot of the time, and 25% of the time we see I, the next step we see, um, we see J. So we say that has a transition probability of 25%. So we say PIJ is 25%. Um, now suppose the rest of the time we see I, it goes to K. So PIK would have a 75% transition probability. Um, what you see in all sorts of different human contexts, and in humans as young as, as nine months old, you see, we see that um, people are really good at detecting these differences in transition probabilities. So they're surprised when they see a rare transition or they're able to anticipate uh, more frequent transitions. So for instance, if they have to do some sort of motor response, then they'll respond faster to a higher probability transition just because they were better able to anticipate it. So the reaction time will be lower for the higher probability thing and larger reaction time for the lower probability thing. Um, and so there's this idea in cognitive science that, that, that humans are, are sort of these machines that are doing a good job at estimating these transition probabilities. Um, and this raises an interesting question, which people have started to think about over the last five years or so, which is what would you expect um, if we were to show people a sequence that was just a random walk on this network that we were looking at before? And I want to point out, and we already sort of talked about this briefly, that this network has a special property that all the nodes have uh, four connections. So all the nodes have degree four. And what this means is that when you're doing a random walk, every time you're at a node, there's four possibilities of where you're gonna go next. So there's a uniform 25% transition probability for every, every transition that you see. So every edge represents a 25% transition probability. So if we have this idea that humans are these transition probability estimating machines, um, then we should expect that people will just realize that all these transition probabilities are the same and we shouldn't see any differences in them being surprised for one transition versus another or 
if we were to do a reaction time task, they should be, the reaction time should be roughly the same for every stimulus that they see. Um, but it turns out that this is not the case at all. And these are, some, these are some experiments that have been done in my lab and some other labs recently. Um, I'm going to talk about the details, but the general idea, I'll get to the general idea at the end, the details aren't that important. Um, but for example, what one, one effect that we see is that uh, people are more surprised when they, when they witness one of these transitions across one of these clusters than they are when they see a transition within one of these sort of clusters of nodes. So for instance, their reaction times would increase when they go from this node to this node. But if they went from this node to this node, it would be roughly, it would be much, a much faster reaction time. Um, and what this means is that people are somehow systematically over predicting the probability of a within cluster transition, and they're systematically under predicting the probability, or they're surprised by one of these cl transitions across clusters. And you can, there's other effects that you can show. So for instance, if you just average people's behavior overall in random walks in this network, versus some other network. So this network, these networks are, are random, but still have that same property that all the nodes have four connections. So all the transitions in this network still have 25% probability. So we should still not expect any differences in behavior across these networks. Um, but you see that people in this more structured network are better able to anticipate what's coming next than in this network, in these random, randomly organized networks. You're right, mm -hmm. talk about this more. But in terms of the way in which you are having participants interact with these networks, is it visual? Yeah, yeah. So I, I wasn't. I, I actually have an extra slide describing the experiment. Okay. But the, the, I, yeah, the general idea of the experiment is that you have someone sitting at a computer, they see some stimulus, um, and then they have to respond by pressing keys on a keyboard. And so each, each node in the network is a given stimulus, and then that elicits a response. So as they are seeing the sequence, they see it on, like a, a stimulus, they respond, then they see the next one, they respond. So if they respond more quickly, we say that they're better able to anticipate like what's coming next. And people are somehow better able to anticipate what's coming next in this network relative to this network. Even though the transition probability, there is still a 25% transition probability. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very related question, but so like for a network like this, like the layout matters, just not like which nodes are connected to other nodes. Yeah, yeah, Because exactly. like those two, okay, because those would be exactly the same, except for the, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah, so that's the interesting thing, is that, so the, if you're at one, at one node in either of these graphs, if you just focus on one node, so we could focus on this node, there's four possible places you could go next, um, and that's true in this network as well. But somehow people are just more able to, better able to predict what's about to come next in this network than in this network. So something about this, the bigger structure of the network is helping people anticipate what's coming next. Just to understand a little bit more, because so because it, each node has four connections, is it true then that in terms of the amount of time spent within each cluster mm -hmm. with a random walk, are is is the time spent in a cluster kind of coherent and then there's a lower probability it'll go to another cluster? So you could you could say, it is true that if you're at, say, this node, then there's a three over four probability of going back into the cluster and a one over four going along this one edge. Um, so that's true, you're always more likely to stay in the cluster than to go across, but to anticipate the specific stimulus is still just 25%. But that general intuition is what we're gonna we're going to be working with. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of like, you said that they were more surprised when you went between the clusters. So is there a way they were getting feedback on their response to say yes or no? Or We just, when we say more surprised, it just took them longer to respond. Like they see the new stimulus and they have to like think, of, like they weren't able to anticipate it. So they like slowed down in their response. Their reaction time was like, was longer, it was slower. So that's what we mean by surprise. What is the response? Just a, you they have one hand on a on a keyboard and they just press a combination of buttons that is shown to them. I can actually get into the, the actual experiment later if y'all are interested. I tried not to get into the specific experiment just because it gets confusing and then I I find that I end up talking about it for like fifteen minutes. <laughs> so the the broad idea here is that there's something about 
the structure, the large scale structure of networks that's influencing people's estimates of transition probabilities. So it's not just that they're estimating transition probabilities, they're being influenced by the structure of the network. That's sort of the upshot here. Um, so then you could ask, can we build a simple model that's trying, that, that gets at how people are, are estimating these transition probabilities and how the network structure might be influencing those estimates? So what I did is I started with this simple little cartoon picture. So we have this person, and they've seen this sequence of stimuli. Um, now they could estimate the transition probabilities just by counting the number of times they've seen one stimulus go to some other stimulus. That would be the simplest thing you would think to do if you were to write a computer program, for instance. Um, and if you were to do that, if you were basically just to keep a tally of the number of times you've seen one stimulus go to another, then you would very quickly converge to an accurate estimate of what the transition probabilities are. But it's not, that's not a very realistic sort of rendition of what might be happening in an actual person's head. So in reality, rather than remembering this perfect ordered sequence, they might have some mental errors and accidentally sort of switch up the order of two, these two nodes here. And then they might also maybe switch up the order of these two nodes. Um, so that when they look back in their memory and they're trying to remember the order of the sequence that they saw, they don't remember the exact sequence. They instead remember the sort of shuffle, locally shuffled sequence that has some errors. Um, and so we're going to use this idea to try to see if this might explain the, the effects that we're seeing in these human experiments. So to be a bit more quantitative, what we need is a distribution um, that describes how far a node sort of gets shuffled in someone's memory. So here, delta t on the x-axis is just how far does a node drift in someone's memory from where it actually happened in real life. Um, and then q is just the probability of that happening. So with some high probability, you get a delta t of zero, so the node stays exactly where it, it actually happened. And then some lower probability, the node shifts one space, some lower probability shifts two spaces, and so on and so forth. Um, now, in order to make any sort of quantitative prediction, we need to derive somehow a mathematical form for what Q is. Uh, and this, this is going to be the most intense math that we're going to have. But I think it's useful to see just because it helps to see how you can like apply ideas from math and physics or even linguistics or computer science um, to, to sort of formalize your hypotheses. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to use tools from statistical mechanics. But if you haven't studied statistical mechanics, it's going to be, I'll be able to explain it in words anyway, so it's still understandable. Um, so the hypothesis we're going to work with is we're going to say when the brain is choosing what Q is, what this distribution is, it's going to try to, map, it's trying to balance two pressures. Um, and this is sort of like a, an overarching theme in, in parts of computational neuroscience. Um, it's known as the free energy principle. And the general hypothesis is that the brain is typically trying to balance uh, the pressure, two pressures. So one pressure is to minimize errors in what it's trying to do. And the second pressure is to minimize the complexity of, of what it's trying to do. And you can see that those would be sort of competing forces. You could do something very complex and have very low errors. Or you could have very high errors and do something really stupid and very simple. Um, but we need to write down mathematical forms of what we mean by that. So for errors, all I'm going to do is write down the average that distance that a node drifts. So this is just the average delta t. This is how far an average does a node drift in someone's memory. Um, and here, for complexity, what we're going to use is the negative entropy. And just to give you an intuition, you can think of it purely in terms of words and, and pictures. So if, if q is high entropy, that means that it's very flat and equally distributed across all the delta t. So this would look like a straight line here. So that's, that would be a high entropy distribution. And what that would mean is that if I asked you what node happened at time t, it would be completely shuffled somewhere in, in your memory. So you would throw your hands in the air and you'd say, I don't know what node happened at time t. And that would be a very low complexity thing to do, just always saying, I have no idea. That's the simplest thing you could possibly do. So high entropy, in, in this case, represents sort of low complexity. Um, and on the other side of the coin, if you, have, if you have a low entropy distribution, so if Q is low entropy, then it would be a spike right here at zero and then flat. And what that means is that with 100% probability, you, you remember the exact order of the sequence. And that's like the most complex thing you could do. You'd be like a computer. You just always remember the exact order. So 
So that means that low entropy would be high complexity. So that's the justification for quantifying complexity as the negative entropy. Mm -hmm. What if you vary consistently two or three off always? You just shift. So if, if this was like a spike at one or, or a spike at two. Yeah. So we, we did make an extra assumption that I didn't say here that this drops off monotonically, um, which is just, it just seems to be correct. And there's actually, we've done experiments that have shown that that's actually the case. Good. So it makes sense, but it is actually the case. So if the complexity is high, it's the most likely thing is that the spike is going to be at zero and not at some other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. They'll just remember exactly where something happened. Yeah, yeah. So all you do here is you say let's write down a total cost. So you just combine these two costs and you just add them together. Um, except we include this one new parameter. So this is the only parameter in the entire model. Um, and it simply represents, you can think about it again as just, as just the accuracy of, of, someone's, of someone's learning, of their, of their learning algorithm. So for example, if, if beta is high, then they're going to try to minimize these errors, um, and they won't care about complexity. If beta is low, then they're going to try to minimize this term. They're going to try to minimize their complexity without regard to errors. Um, and so from, if anyone has taken statistical mechanics, this is what we call the free energy. And this is exactly analogous to the, the inverse temperature from, free, from um, statistical mechanics. But again, if you haven't taken physics or stat mech, you can just think of it as accuracy in their learning. So if we minimize this total cost with respect to, with respect to Q, then out pops a mathematical prediction for what Q should look like. It should just drop off exponentially. Um, and again, we only have this one parameter beta. So this was just an exercise to show you all that you can use, just, just starting with a simple hypothesis, the brain is balancing these two, these two uh, competing forces. You can come up with some math to describe, to predict what this, this distribution should look like. So now we can, we can imagine people do actually learn the, the, estimate the transition probabilities like this. And we can go back, we can go back to the network that we were looking at before. We can say, what does the network that people learn look like in their, in their head? So again, we have this one parameter beta. So if we look at high beta or high accuracy, um, they're very accurate. So this again is a peak at zero, and people just remember the exact order. And if they remember the exact order, they're acting like a computer, and they'll just eventually exactly learn the the um, the transition structure. So they'll exactly estimate what the transition probabilities are between all the different nodes. And on the other end of the spectrum. <coughs> If beta is very low, then people are just trying to minimize um, their complexity, and they don't care about having errors. So in this case, this distribution is flat, and you completely shuffle the order of the nodes in your head. And if you completely shuffle the, the order of things in your head, and then you try to remember what node happened right after some other node, you're just going to associate all the nodes. And you learn, so that's what we see here, where you see these light edges uh, between all the different nodes. And they don't learn any of the network structure whatsoever. But for some intermediate amount of beta, so for beta around like one, this distribution drops off as we sort of expected. Um, and people, at the end of the day, they learn a, they estimate the transition probabilities in this fuzzy way. So it kind of looks like the true transition probabilities, but it also is, is fuzzy. It's, it's got errors in it. And I want to direct your attention to a couple edges. So if we consider this edge, just consider any edge that's within, within a cluster. So this one, or maybe this guy. Um, you can see that it's maintaining a lot of its edge weight. So people will estimate that transition with about 25% probability, which is exactly accurate. So, that's, so they're, they're being very accurate in their estimate of the probabilities of these transitions. But there should be a transition here. So there does exist a transition between these, these two nodes. But somehow, through mixing up the order of the nodes in time, they, they start to systematically underestimate the probabilities of these transitions. So you can see that this is, I guess it's kind of hard to see on this projector, but it's about 10 to 15%. So if you look at this gray, it's somewhere around like here. So it would be about 10 to 15%, when really that transition has a 25% probability. So they're systematically more surprised by these, by these between cluster transitions. Um, and so we can, you can see already that we can use these ideas to predict 
at least that first effect that we saw in the human experiments. Um, so that's just, this is just showing that. So on the x-axis here, we have that accuracy parameter beta. And on the y-axis, all, all I'm plotting is the estimated probability of a within-cluster transition divided by the estimated probability of a between-cluster transition. Mm -hmm. Question. So is the purpose to maximize complexity or the function maximize, like minimize cost? Like that's a good question. So, so we set, the hypothesis is that there's some total cost. And that total cost, you can break down into two sort of competing costs. Okay. One, one is to, one cost is errors, and then the other cost is complexity. And you're minimizing that combination. And some, one person might care more about minimizing one than another. Okay. But yeah, the, the hypothesis is that the, everyone's brain is trying to minimize their total cost. Okay, so how would the structured cluster represent higher complexity? So the complexity isn't, isn't of the network itself, it's of their learning algorithm. Okay. Um, that's a really good question though, and I will get to, I will focus more on the network side, so not on the human side, on the network side, at the, after, after talking about the human side. So hold on to that question, because I will get to that. It's a good question. <clears throat> so this is just showing that people will over predict within cluster transitions relative to between cluster transitions. So in reality, in reality, these two probabilities are the same, so this ratio should be one. But in the model, uh, in these intermediate accuracy ranges, you see that people predict within cluster transitions almost 1.6 or 1.7 times as likely as a between cluster transition. And you can make very similar predictions for this, for this other experiment that we saw. So if you just compare the estimated probabilities in this modular network to those in this random network, um, you see again that people are systematically uh, overestimating probabilities in the modular network relative to the random network. Um, so these are just simple predictions of sort of the human effects that we saw in the experiments. Mm -hmm. Is the, is the, the maximum of this ratio, that's just... It just popped out from the model somehow. Yeah, I don't know, it's un I don't know exactly why it is what it is. But you will, so one interesting thing actually is that you see that they do have their max, if you look at the x-axis, they have their maximums at about the same beta, which is kind of interesting. So near about 0.1 or 0.2, or this would be 0.1, this would be 0.2. Um, you see that the maximum here is about beta of 0.1 or 0.2, and here you see that it's about, at about the same value, which is interesting. And where does the human, where, where does the experimental value lie? On the I'm glad. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> oh, on the on the y-axis or on the x-axis? Where do people fall on this on this beta axis? Isn't it we actually measure the ratio? So it's know? hard to for for if we actually measured the ratio of people's reaction times, it it's not quite as simple because there's a floor reaction time just of how like even if you anticipate with something 100 percent probability, it's yeah. still it'd still be like it wouldn't be like zero. Um, yeah. It wouldn't be zero reaction time, so it's it's not quite as easy to just divide those. So you can talk about just differences in reaction time, and you see a difference in reaction time of about thirty milliseconds on average uh, between between for in sort of in both of these cases. This case it's about forty milliseconds. This case it's about twenty milliseconds difference. But the in terms of estimating people's betas, that's actually the last thing that I was going to talk about with regard to this. So this is actually just kind of a fun side note. So you could ask, we've talked a lot about this one parameter beta, how accurate are people's sort of learning? And it turns out that you can go back to the data and actually estimate it for individual people. So you could take one person's data, so you look at their behavior, and then you can say what value of beta in our model best predicts their, um, their behavior. This is, it's just like fitting a line, like what value of the slope best fits the, some, some scatter plot. You can ask a similar question, which is what value of beta best fits these, the human behavior that we're seeing? Um, and, and, and then for each person we say, well, this value of beta best describes this person. And what we see here, this is what I'm plotting here is the distribution over betas among our subjects. We had about 360 subjects. Um, and what you find is that about 20% of people behave as if they have a beta of zero. So they're completely inaccurate. They're completely shuffling the order of things in their head. They're acting like a rock. They're not learning anything. 
Um, and on the complete other side of the spectrum, you see that about 10 to 15% of people behave as if they have a beta approaching infinity, so they're acting like a computer, which we've gotten actually questions asking if there are computers taking our experiments, which <laughs> is actually an issue, because these are all online, so it could have been some computer, like, doing that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but something like the vast majority, so about 65 or 70% of the people lie in this intermediate range. Um, and among these intermediate people, we find a mean of about 0.3, which you can see is near sort of this maximum. It's about there, uh, which is part of the reason why we think that these effects are so strong in people. So somehow there's something about people's learning processes that have them near the maximum of these, of these effects, which is something that we're trying to figure out. So this is a quick intermediate point if anyone has any questions about that bit. We're gonna shift and focus more on networks now and not as much on the human. So we answered these, so we have this picture again where we have a network and now we know what PIJ is. It's just the probability of transitioning from some item I to some other item J. And then you have some sequence that the, that the human observes and they, they're, in their head they're estimating what these, these transition estimates are or these transition probabilities are. So we asked this question, how do people estimate these transition probabilities, or how do they learn these networks? Um, and we now have a model, so we have a model for p hat for what's going on in people's head. Uh, so you can sort of switch what you're thinking about now, and, and instead of focusing on the human and how they're estimating what PIJ is, you can, you can ask, well, what kinds of networks, what kinds of network structures communicate more or less information to a human observer, or are able to communicate more efficiently to a human? Um, and this is the question that we're gonna answer right now. So, it turns out, so we have, this, we have this question that we're interested in, how much information does a network communicate to a human observer? And it turns out that a very closely related question actually lies at the heart of what's known as information theory. Um, so information theory is, is, was sort of developed, the simplest reading of history says that information theory was developed all in one fell swoop by this guy Claude Shannon in 1948. He wrote arguably the coolest paper ever, um, where he basically invented this whole theory and most of the tools that are still used today in one paper. Um, and he was, the, the, he had a lot of questions in mind, but the primary question that he was trying to ask or answer was how much information does a network, or not a network, how much information does a sequence of items produce? And we've already seen that you can think of a sequence of items oftentimes as just a random walk on a network. So an equivalent question is how much information does a network produce when it's generating these sequences of items? Um, and what Shannon showed is that the answer to this question, how much information is a network producing, is just the entropy of, of the network or the entropy of this random walk. Um, and I, again, just to be a little bit mappy, everyone gets, I think, scared by entropy a lot of the time, at least I know I was in college. But it's really simple, it's just minus the log of the probability, um, which is all you gotta remember. Everyone says P log P, just remember minus log of probability, and then these brackets just mean an average. So you just average over the whole